My name is Rick Atwater. I'm a licensed clinical professional counselor. My specialty is addictions, and I've been working with addicts and family members since 1982. What I want to share with you uh, is opiate issues that you hear people talking about today. Uh, that, that they, you know, they call it an epidemic. I started to see more um, heroin-related. Uh, cases, mostly family members coming in asking what they can do for their kid. And we started a group um, called the Heroin Awareness Foundation. Our mission was to educate and increase awareness about the heroin problem at that time. And this was really the beginning of the, the community becoming aware of the heroin uh, problem. Overdose deaths continue to rise. They continue to this day. We did what we could then. Um, but we want to do more, which is why we want to tell the story that we're going to present to you today. This story that you're about to see is just one story, but it is representative of the 130 people who die in this country every day from opioid uh, addiction overdose. Some of you uh, probably have been affected by addiction. Many of you uh, are likely to have been affected by addiction. Not all of you affected by her the heroin epidemic, but by addiction to other things. So, so watching this documentary might be troublesome for you, might cause you to have feelings that are uncomfortable. Uh, so we want you to understand that, that, that those feelings are normal. And we hope that you will talk to somebody about those things. Others of you have not been affected by addiction. Um, this might help you to see the size of the problem we face. I've, uh, I've been kind of bummed out recently because um, my dog has one of those cones around his head. <laughs> no, because, yeah, he got into a fight with another dog, and the other dog put a f cone on his head. <laughs> what? That's crazy. So Harris started being a comedian when he was three years old. And his direction was strictly to go be a comedy person. At just 22, he had moved to LA because he um, did an internship at Comedy Central. He just started going to all the comedy clubs for free at night for open mics. And Sarah Silverman um, happened to be there the night that he performed. And she asked him, if you have anything you can submit in writing to me, I'm looking for a staff writer for my new show that's coming on TV. And just like that, he was hired. When that was done after two years, Harris went um, to an interview for Parks and Recreation to be a staff writer. And he got that job, and that's where he stayed for about seven seasons until it ended. And so um, at, at that time, during the Parks and Recreation, he was also writing movie scripts. He uh, actually wrote a book. It's called Humble Brag, The Art of False Modesty. He had gotten about over a million followers just with this one word. And it eventually ended up in a book and in the dictionary. So then his last project before he passed away was he was producing and writing for Netflix, which um, Aziz Ansari uh, created. And he was on his way to move to New York and really start a new career as an actor, uh, which he was super excited about. So that's, that's the successful side of Harris. So now I'll talk about the, the uh, addiction side of Harris. He, when he was about, I'd say 26, he um, got a, had developed a back problem and he was in excruciating pain. And he, he called us that night. He didn't know what to do. He was on the floor screaming. And we both said, go to the hospital. We don't know what to do. And so they prescribed Oxycontin for him. And that was, that was the beginning of everything. 
Harris had a, a really, really large, larger than life personality. And that was gonna be the perfect storm for him. He was, he was doomed. And he tried, he took that for about a year because he was starting to get high with it. And um, finally, uh, he, three days before his sister's wedding, he shared that news with her that he was an addict. And he was going to take care of it. He was going to go to a um, therapist that was putting him on Suboxone, and he was going to work this thing out. We, had, we should not worry about it. Harris, at that time, told us that he was getting ready to go into rehab in March. Um, and I was so happy. I thought, yo, cool. This is, gonna, this is it. This is, he needed to go. He's taking care of it. He will be okay. And so he went into rehab in California, and it was uh, a real cushy rehab. It was uh, Malibu Promises. And they had their own chef, and it was like a country club for him. And at the time, when he talked to us on the phone, he really began to sound like himself. So he was just starting to really come back to us. And then... He got out of rehab, and we took a trip to Utah, um, a family vacation. Uh, it was it was kind of weird. He um, he he. We wanted him to go to an AA meeting there, and he said, "I don't want to." And he said, I, "I'm so pissed off because I can't have a beer. You know, I just want a beer, and I can't." I have to not do any of this stuff for the rest of my life, and it's really starting to piss me off. And we just noticed that something wasn't right, but we just didn't know what. And so in September of that year, I was actually at Stephanie's house, and she walked in with the baby in her arms, and she got a text from Harris. And the text said, Stephanie, I am on my way to Hazelden in, Ar in um, Oregon, Portland, and uh, I've relapsed, and um, it's on heroin. She looked at the text, and she turned white. And I knew, I knew something was wrong. And she said, Mom, look. And I saw the text, and I just remember falling on the floor and saying, He's going to die. This is it. This is heroin. He is going to die. And we called my husband. He came right over. And I finally ended up talking to Harris uh, late in the, in the night. And he said, Mom, please don't worry. I promise you, this time I'm going to really, really hunker down and take care of this problem. Please don't worry. And so he stayed there a month, and I even went up there for the family week. And I remember being so upset because I was only allowed to see him for one hour every day. And, you know, we learned all about addiction at that time, which was great. I, I didn't really know how to handle it. And um, the last day, just before we checked out, he was going to come to my hotel and then go to L.A., and I was going to go to Houston. He was, we were with his therapist for 15 minutes. And I remember saying to her, Harris, you know, if you screw up here, you're going to end up living under a bridge or you're going to die. And he said, okay, I'm cool. We're doing this. It's good. He, she shooed us away because it was uh, after the time. And I was thinking, I need so much more time with you and him. I need to talk about this with somebody and Harris. And, you know, that I was so upset about that. And we got back to the hotel and I'm, I'm seeing this edginess again. I mean, that night I'm seeing it. And, you know, now for looking back, I think he was reaching out for help. I do. We were all gonna get together for Thanksgiving at my house. Everybody was coming. It was going to be a glorious time. 
And the morning that I was going to pick Harris up at the airport, he texted me and he said, I'm not coming home. I'm so sorry. I don't want to ruin your holiday. I've relapsed. And my husband and I said, we will come out there the day after Thanksgiving and be with you. And we did. We went out there the day after Thanksgiving. And that weekend was the worst. He was detoxing on his own with Suboxone. But I remember thinking, you know, he seems like he's not too bad. I mean, this is pretty good. This takes his drug and he feels good and he's going to come out of this. And, you know, honestly, Harris was shooting out with us in the house. I mean, he wasn't on, he wasn't taking the drug. Anyway, the weekend was horrible. You know, we stayed in the entire weekend thinking he was detoxing and being okay. And I, and, and we begged Harris to please come home and be with us over the holidays so maybe we could look at some options for him, you know, for more help because he didn't seem to be himself again. And he came home and my idea honestly was to try to get him to a rehab in Texas for about six months because what I, from what I had learned, long-term rehab can be very beneficial. And he refused and he said, um, I, I'm gonna go back to LA in, D, in January and I'm gonna find a sober living home because that's what Hazelden told me to do in the first place and I didn't listen. And he said, that's what I need to do. And I have to tell you, he was detoxing at my house. My husband is a physician and we couldn't, we couldn't do it. It, he, I, it, was, he was so sick. I remember laying on his bed. We were both crying. And I said, why do you do this? Can't you remember how horrible this feels and not do it anymore? I don't understand. And, he, he, and I said, we're going to put you into a, a rehab in, in Houston right now because we can't watch you do this. And so a friend of mine got him into a, a rehab here called Park, and he, he came out around Christmas Day, and he was, seemed to be much, much better. And he's, we were planning to go to L.A. to put him in a home, which he agreed to. And I said, you know what? I am not going to allow you to go out there until we find this home. I'm going to go with you, and I'm going to help you with this project. And I did. I stayed with him until we found, we looked at many homes in L.A. and we found a, a good one, we thought. It was in the Hollywood Hills. And he, he went in the day I left, and um, I, felt, I felt okay. I felt like things were going to go okay. He was also working on the show, Master of None, while all this was happening. And... He wanted to audition for this part, and he had to audition like four times. And you know, before it would have been a shoe-in, he would have gotten it immediately. So he worked really hard to do that. He even, this is telling, Aziz lived in the same neighborhood as Harris, and he would pick him up to go to work. And Harris told them at the show that he was going to go for outpatient treatment three days a week, and he would be able to work with them, you know, the rest of the days. But he had to put this, you know, in the front. And they agreed that it was fine. And he would come home the days that he had to work at five in the morning so they would not know he was in a sober home and that he would act like he was living at home and he was fine. I mean, this was all a charade. And stigma is again at play. And he finally got the part. Two weeks before he passed away, he told us, and I have not ever heard such excitement in his voice. And he was in, he was in sober living and he had gotten the part. He was so excited. He was moving to Manhattan. He showed me the, the uh, place he was going to be living. It was on his computer when he passed away. 
his plans were to move ahead and have a great life. He checked out of the sober home early. He was there for two months. He checked out maybe three days before he was supposed to. And the next night, he did uh, a stand-up uh, set, and it, it was a door. It was wonderful. It went great. And sometime between then and, I guess, noon, when the police found him, he had overdosed. And I had gone to movies, to the movies, and out to dinner with my girlfriends. I got out of the theater, and I had um, an L.A. number on my phone, and I, I just kind of ignored it. I thought, oh, you know, no big deal. I don't know what that is. I'll wait till I go home. So we went out to dinner, and Stephanie texted me, and she said, Mom, are you going to go to um, play cards or anything tonight? I said, no, what's wrong? And she said, I just want you to come home. And so I got to my apartment, and I remember holding on to my friends and just saying, what's happened? Is he sick? Is he in the hospital? I didn't think he died. And I walked in, and my, my husband told them to go home, and Stephanie was there. And he said, remember what we said what happened to Harris? It happened. And I remember saying, God, please don't make me do this. Please, I don't know how to do this. Don't take him from me. And we sat on the couch, just speechless, you know, for I don't know, even know how long. And she got a phone call from Harris's manager in L.A. And he said, uh, make sure you tell your parents that he's gone because he didn't know she'd told us because TMZ found out about it earlier and it was all over the news. And we had the funeral. There were 500 people there. A lot of people had come from LA. And the very next day after the funeral, um, Stephanie and her husband Mike and me and the baby flew out to LA to uh, pack up his home. And my husband wouldn't go. My husband shut down. He shut down that day that he got that news. And he never has come back. And I will tell you that he spends most of his days in the bed because he never, ever got help with this. And he just shut it down. And so he, he's been destroyed. I can't talk to him about it. I'm really alone in this. I mean, I'm, I say I'm alone. I'm with my, my daughter who, you know, gets it. She, she's wonderful. And we went to L.A., and we were going to pack up his whole house. And that, we got there on, actually, we got there on Saturday. And that night, uh, Amy Poehler and Sarah Silverman and a bunch of people had organized a big uh, comedy tribute to Harris at a club. And so we went to that, and it was, it was really gratifying because they were all there. And they all loved him. And I remember Amy Poehler saying, thank you for giving him to us. We loved him so much. And we're going to miss him. And so Sunday morning when we woke up, we both just sat on the floor and we said, how do you do this? We didn't have boxes. We didn't have anything. And so... Uh, the doorbell rang, and we opened the door, and it was so many of his friends with boxes and tape and moving supplies and food, and they didn't leave us until it was done. And I will never, ever forget that. These were good people. You know, you hear that people in L.A. are so affected and, you know, all this. And, you know, Harris surrounded himself with some beautiful people. He had wonderful friends, and interestingly enough, 
he was the only one that was doing drugs. So I feel like, you know, that this, op this OxyContin thing just threw him into the fire. And so we got it all packed up and we went home and, uh, you know, we just spent a long, a, a whole month I stayed in the house and people, there was a meal train and people bought, brought food. And I just remember it was so hard to eat. It was, it, all I wanted to do was sleep. And I mean, it was devastating for Stephanie and me and of course her father who was gone, basically. And um, so right after that, I seeked out grief therapy. And there was a lady here who also lost her son a long time ago from drugs. And I went to her and she was a psychologist. And she got it too, you know, she'd cry with me. And that's exactly what I needed. So after six months, um, we both looked at each other and said, you know, there's not a whole lot more we can do here. And I didn't really have anything else to say. So I stopped going and I, I started looking for support or support groups in Houston that dealt with um, overdose. So my girlfriend Kay, who's my best friend, who truly was my rock, and she went online and she tried to find some support on Facebook for me. And she found a group called GRASP, Grief Recovery After a Substance Passing. And I just started going into the group and hearing all these stories, just like mine. And I mean, just hundreds of people dying every day from this. And I started thinking, I've got, to do, I've got to start this thing in Houston. But in order to start the group, I had to figure out how I was gonna get people to come in. And my girlfriend Kay and I made a flyer and we went around Houston. We took it to the morgue, to funeral homes, to the police, to the fire stations. I mean, we were all over Houston. The first night I had five people. I've had as many as 20 on a good night. In my opinion, this epidemic it's, it's not going away, it's not getting any better, it's getting worse. People are still dying in droves and there's so much that needs to be done. They need to meet this in a different place than they're meeting it. Only if you can get in and do these things with kids, young kids, and educate them early, it's not gonna work. But I feel like if they had really grown up listening to these moms and dads and siblings talking about what's happened, the aftermath is so horrendous. And maybe it would plant the seed. Bonjour, Henry. Your mother and I can't wait to see you. What do you turn yourself now? Bonjour, Henry. Your mother and I can't wait to see you. What do you turn yourself now? This is truly the human side of this of this problem, and 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 thank you for doing this. And please, how, I want to help. I want to get it into every school in this country.
If you're a family member or a friend or a classmate of someone who has an addictions problem or who has passed away from an opioid overdose, there are resources available to you. Go to a Narcotics Anonymous meeting, uh, a Families Anonymous meeting, or an Al-Anon meeting. Those are great places to learn about the disease and to help yourself. Don't wait for other people to start their recovery. Start your own. Don't be ashamed of the person in your family who has an addiction or what's happened to them as a result of their addiction. Talk about it out loud. Use the word, say addiction, say heroin. Talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends or get other resources to help you get unstuck.